Hello and welcome to the Genetics Lab Operon Fusion Lab Procedural Leadoff Lecture. Let's start by discussing the critters we're going to be using in the lab. This should be review. You should have already had the background leadoff lecture that we do as a group in the lecture hall prior to the labs. And of course the strains that we're going to be using are E. coli MC4100 which has a genotype of ERA D- and a LAC operon deletion. It's Delta LAC I P O Z Y A so it's missing the LAC I regulatory gene, the promoter operator and structural genes Z, Y, and A. That's a partial um, genotype, by the way. We've left out some stuff that isn't really relevant for this experiment. That gives it a phenotype of arabinose sensitivity. It's lac minus, and it's ampicillin sensitive, which is important because we will be using ampicillin as a selectable marker for this experiment. And MC4100 is the strain we'll be doing this experiment in. That's what we'll be carrying out all of our infections in. The other strain we'll be using is E. coli MAL-103. MAL-103 is a dilysogen for MUD1, phage MUD1, which uh, is the altered phage mu. It carries the uh, BLA gene, which makes it ampicillin resistant. It carries the ampicillin resistance gene and it carries a partial LAC operon. It doesn't have the promoter for the LAC operon, but it carries the LAC uh, genes. It also carries mu CTS, which um, is a normal working mu phage, except that the C gene of mu is temperature sensitive, so you can force uh, the mu phage to go lytic at higher temperatures. Um, this phage, uh, this strain is also uh, missing the uh, lac operon. You're going to start the experiment by um, getting your phage. And so how are you going to get your phage? The problem, of course, is that MAL-103 is a broken phage, right? When it was genetically engineered, the lytic genes were taken out of it and at least partially replaced with blah and the, the lac genes. So UD1 can't lyse cells. So we actually can't use MUD1 to uh, lyse the cells and uh, you know create a lysate that we can do experiments with. So we're going to have to use that MUCTS to lyse the cells and package MUD1 at the same time. So the way we're going to do this is you're going to obtain some MAL-103. It'll come in a, in a large Delco test tube. Um, it'll probably have a yellow cap like I've shown here on the screen. And you're going to start off by uh, taking a absorbance reading at 540 nanometers. And the way you're going to do that is you'll use a spectrophotometer, either a SPEC20 or a SPEC20+. plus. It'll look something like this. And the way a SPEC20 works, um, hopefully you used something like this if you took Bio300 lab at UMBC or a similar introductory lab somewhere. The way a spectrophotometer works is relatively simple. In fact, it has a light source, which is in fact just a light bulb. It has a filter of some sort 
that blocks the light and makes sure that you have just a, uh, a straight beam of light coming from that light bulb from uh, the light source towards the sample that you're interested in. It, ha it passes through a prism on the way which allows you to select a very specific wavelength of light that you want to hit your sample. And that prism is adjustable. Uh, you have a knob, in fact, on the top of the machine here where it says wavelength selector that adjusts the prism so that you can change the wavelength. We're going to use 540 nanometers and this knob right up here at the top allows you to adjust the wavelength. So we'll change this prism here to adjust it to 540 nanometers, not to 500 as this uh, little picture uh, indicates. There's another uh, barrier here to make sure the light coming out of the prism is uh, straight towards the sample that you insert on the other side of the prism. That sample actually goes right here in the spectrophotometer. This uh, opens up. And then the light will go through your sample and into a photo detector. And the photo detector measures how much of the light that left the light bulb hits the photo detector. And that is measured as the percent transmittance or is converted into a number that's called the absorbance, which is the, uh, the way it's usually read. Okay, and that's in fact how we'll read it, the absorbance at 540 nanometers. And you can use that to determine how much of whatever it is that you're interested in is in the sample. And that could be particulate matter like bacteria, or it could be a chemical that's being produced, or whatever it is that you're interested in that's absorbing the light, removing the light because it's being blocked or absorbed. So you're going to read it at 540 nanometers. That's going to tell us basically the cell concentration that we are starting with. So the sample is going to go right in there. That's going to uh, tell us where we're starting. It should be at right about 0.2 when you start. It may be a little higher or a little lower. We'll dilute it to be right around there, but it keeps growing uh, even as we're aliquoting it out. And that'll tell you that your sample's starting at right about 2 times 10 to the 8th uh, CFUs per mil. You should write down the time when you take the, uh, the measurement. Now we'll show you how to use the SPEC20 in the lab, but it's actually quite easy. When you use a SPEC20, what you do is, the first thing you're going to do is make sure it was turned on. We'll turn them on before you come to lab because they have to warm up. But uh, you turn it on with this knob here on the left side, the zero adjust, so it should already be on and running. This uh, knob here clicks on. You tell the machine then, what's called zeroing the machine, you tell the machine what nothing looks like. Okay, This is setting the machine to zero. And what you do is you aim this you looking at the uh, screen, the meter here on the center of the machine, you aim the needle at the zero on the left side of the meter. And so you're going to zero the dial, uh, zero the needle to the left side with the left knob. So you zero to the left with the left. And that's telling the machine what nothing at all looks like. You're setting the zero. And then what you're going to, going to do is you're going to take a test tube that will be provided for you with the same buffer or media that the bacteria are growing in but with no bacteria in it because that's going to absorb some light and that's going to tell the machine what the buffer itself or the media itself absorbs and that's called blanking and so what you do is you're going to take that sample and you'll put it in here and then you use the 100 percent transmittance adjustment knob this knob to the right and you'll use this to blank the machine and you put the needle now to the zero on the right and now you're going to blank to the right with the right knob 
So you zero to the left with the left, you blank to the right with the right. So it's very easy. First you point it at the left zero, then with the sample inside, you point it to the right zero. After you do that, you take the sample out, the uh, blank out, and now you put your sample in, and whatever the needle points at, that's the absorbance. You just read it from that bottom scale. Okay, record the time, and you're off to the races. You're ready to do your experiment. And if you're uh, looking at your procedure, what you'll see is it tells you to immediately put your sample into a water bath, a shaking water bath, at 42 degrees centigrade. Our shaking water bath looks pretty much like this, a little more beat up and old, but very similar. It'll be off to the side because it's noisy. You should turn off the shaking function of the water bath when you put something in or out or take something out of the water bath so that you don't break a tube or drop something in it but uh, make sure you leave the entire unit turned on and make sure you turn it back on whenever you leave the water bath. These samples need to be shaking. We put it at 42 degrees of course because we need to disable mu C and cause these cells to begin uh, to induce the phage. So you're going to put them at 30 degrees, excuse me, at 42 degrees for 30 minutes. During that incubation, you can, uh, you'll get some instructions from your TAs. They'll show you where some things are, um, some last minute prep, and then you can label your plates, set up your dilutions, chat with your partners, <laughs> write in your notebook, whatever it is you want to do. After 30 minutes, you're going to take another reading at 540 nanometers. If you haven't banged the spec 20, you don't need to re-blank it um, if you use the same spec 20. If, um, if it's been moved or jostled, then go ahead and re-blank it. And then you're going to move it from 40 two degrees to a different water bath that looks very similar on the other side of the room at 37 degrees. The reason we move it to 37 degrees is we know empirically that we get a higher yield of phage by moving it to 37 degrees. Okay. Now once you move it to 37 degrees you need to begin checking the um, absorbance at 540 degree, uh, 40 nanometers every 10 or so minutes. The absorbance will begin to drop as cells lice and your job is to begin the experiment as soon as the absorbance reaches 0 0.05. It may do so very quickly in as low as 15 or 20 minutes. It may take an entire half an hour. It may take a little bit more. If something unusual happens and it stops uh, going down, if it starts going up, you should talk to your TA. But as soon as it hits 0 0.05 or if it goes below 0 0.05, go ahead and continue the experiment. The way you're going to continue the experiment, and we are in uh, part one, of course, pre preparation of the MuD1 lysate. The way you'll do this, of course, is add chloroform. And the reason you're going to add chloroform is not all of the cells have lysed. You have to kill anything that didn't lyse. So the chloroform is there to kill anything that didn't lyse. So up until now, You've uh, perhaps used vortexers for mixing DNA and molecular biological things in microcentrifuge tubes. And you've probably vortexed things a lot more than they actually needed to be vortexed. This time, you need to vortex a lot more than you think. We've got to make sure that chloroform gets in there and kills 
any remaining cells because they will contaminate your experiment. We need them dead. So Vortex it really, really well. Spend at least a good 5, 10 seconds, 20 seconds. Spend as long as you want vortexing those cells. Make sure they're dead. Once you've done that, you're going to take <clears throat> excuse me, a mil and a half out of the sample. Remember, you're starting with five mils, so you've got plenty. You're going to take a mil and a half, transfer it to a microcentrifuge tube, centrifuge it in a microcentrifuge, make sure it's balanced just for a minute. That'll pull down any cell debris. You will not see much of a pellet because the cells are all lysed open. What's in the supernatant are the phage. Cell debris will be in the pellet. This will give you a nice sterile lysate. Take off the top mill. Don't disturb the pellet. Move it to a new uh, microcentrifuge tube. And that is your undiluted or 10 to the 0 phage lysate. And that's what you will be using for the rest of your experiment, either by diluting it or by using it directly for some parts of your experiment. Okay, so that takes us to part two. And so part two is actually something you've done before. Now when you've done this in previous experiments, you were taking cells and diluting them to get viable cell counts. Here, what you're going to do is you're going to take phage and dilute it to get something called a titer. And that sounds a little weird, a titer, but in fact, that's just what you call the concentration of a phage. How did you figure out the concentration of cells? You diluted it and plated it. How do you figure out the concentration of a phage? You dilute it and plate it on top of a lawn of cells. So that's what you're going to do. So we need to do a dilution series. When we diluted the cells, what we did was we diluted them all the way until they were dilute enough that we could plate them. Well, we're going to be doing several different experiments, so we're going to need several different dilutions. So we're just going to make all of the different dilutions that we need for all of the experiments at the same time. So what we are going to do is take our undiluted phage and we are going to make a bunch of tenfold dilutions. We're going to make negative 1, negative 2, 10 to the negative 3. We're going to make a negative 5, negative 6, and negative 7. Now you notice I skipped the negative 4. So we could do 1 to 10 dilutions all the way across and include the 10 to the negative 4. If you find that easier, that's fine. You don't actually need a negative 4. That'll just be a wasted tube. But if it makes you happy, go ahead and make it. <laughs> On the other hand, you can do this dilution and just jump over that one and save yourself a step. Whichever way you do it, make sure you do the dilutions carefully and correctly. If you do them this way, you're going to use every single dilution. By now, you should know how to do 1 to 10 or 1 to 100 dilutions. So these are mostly 1 to 10 with one 1 to 100 dilution. So here we have 1 to 10 dilutions, and we're using 100 microliters into 900 microliters. That's a very nice, safe, and reliable 1 to 10 dilution, except for one place where we're going to do 10 microliters into 990 and that, of course, is a 1 to 100 uh, dilution. Every single time, make sure you vortex it well and then use a new tip. Of course, you are certainly welcome to set up all of those tubes with the sterile dilution media ahead of time. It <clears throat> okay, so label those tubes nicely. Microcentrifuge tubes are what you should use for these, not the uh, long disposable glass tubes. So now you have your different dilutions of phage, and these are what you're going to be using for a lot of different experiments now. 
So the first thing we're going to use them for is figuring out the concentration of the phage here in our undiluted, just like if you're going to do a viable cell count. So the concentration is pretty high, so what we're going to need to use are the ones that we've diluted quite a bit, the 5, 6, and 7. So what we're going to do is we're going to take some tubes, and you can label them whatever you want. I'll just label them A, B, C, D, and E. And we're going to need to put some E. coli in them. And we're going to use the E. coli MC4100. Add 200 microliters of E. coli MC4100 to four of them, A, B, C, and D, not to the fifth. That's going to be a control. No cells. To A, B, and C, we're going to add some of the phage. 100 microliters of the 10 to the negative 5th to A, 100 microliters of the 10 to the negative 6th to B, and 100 microliters of the 10 to the negative 7th to C. To D, we have cells but no phage. That's another control. To E, the one that we didn't put any cells in, we have phage but no cells. So we'll use the undiluted phage, the phage that you didn't do any of your dilution series to. So this undiluted 10 to the 0 lysate is the same lysate here. I just didn't want to draw a long, complicated looking arrow. Okay, that's why I made it red. So use 100 microliters straight of your undiluted phage. These two things are controls. Okay? phage by itself, and cells by itself. After you make these tubes, what you're doing is you're setting up infections. So this is a lot like the Newcomb experiment, except that we're adding a whole bunch of cells here, and these should create lawns. This is a lot of cells. We're going to allow these infections to happen for about 15 minutes at room temperature. So you can give them a gentle shake right at the beginning of the infection, maybe a couple times during the infection, but you don't want to keep vortexing them. You don't want to disrupt the infections. Room temperature means sitting on your desk. These are the disposable glass tubes that we use for experiments, where we keep the caps, but throw the tubes away when we're done. At the end of 15 minutes, what you're going to do is you're going to get the pre-measured top auger from the hot water bath, one at a time. Don't grab several of them, or else they will solidify in your hand and in the tube. You pour top auger into the tube and onto the plate. You're going to use LBC plates. They're the regular looking plates that you've used before. They'll have a single orange stripe on them. Remember, top auger into the tube. That mixes it onto the plate. Remember to do this quickly, or else you won't spread it evenly over the plate. You want to pour it evenly over the plate. Make sure to get rid of any gaps or air bubbles Swirl it by swirling it put it down and then don't touch it because you want it to be a nice smooth coverage. You're going to incubate it overnight. It's probably better to look at these later in the day the next day, not early the next morning, so that the plaques have a little bit of time to form. And then you're going to count them. Now you're doing three different dilutions, 10 to the negative 5th, 6th, and 7th, so don't expect them all to give you good counts. That's the reason you're doing different dilutions. It's very possible that one of them will be too many to count, or that one of them will have just a couple of them. If one of them has a perfect count, then two of them likely won't. Too many to count might be a thousand. If you have 10 on one, which of course you can count, then you're going to have a hundred on the one that's ten times more and a thousand on the one that's ten times more than that. 
the plaques are going to be very small. Mu plaques are quite small. Think about what you should see on this tube here, a tube that you only put cells in. Should you see plaques on that one? So that's a control telling us whether or, or not our cells are contaminated. Think about what we should see here. We put only phage, no cells in there. Should we see a lawn? Should we see any, pla any uh, colonies at all? If you see any colonies, what happened? So these are not mu plaques. Mu plaques would be kind of hard to see on here. These are uh, a little bigger than the plaques you're going to see. But one of the things that you should pay attention to when you're looking at the plaques is can you see through them? You'll notice that the lab manual asks you, are your plaques clear or cloudy? Are they clear or turbid? Turbid means cloudy. Here's an example of a clear plaque. You notice you can see right through it just as if there had been no lawn. This is the bacterial lawn. It's been completely overgrown. These are plaques, areas of clearing, where a phage has killed the cells and the neighboring cells around the cells that it originally infected. These are plaques as well, but because not all of the cells were killed, some are still alive, though infected, um, that plaque is cloudy. There's still cells alive in there. Here, none of them are alive. Clear plaque, cloudy plaque. So look at your plaque and see if you can see through it. All right. So that's part two. So then you got to continue with the experiment. You're going to use some of these other dilutions to actually carry out the experiment. And that is to investigate what happens when you create operon fusions, either in uh, one particular part of the genome or throughout the genome. And what we're going to do is we're going to take four tubes. You can label them anything you want. But I think uh, 0, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3 are probably a good way to label them. Those are the concentrations that they're coming from up there, right? 0, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. If you want to label them something else, that's fine too. OK. And the, what you're going to do with them is you're going to add 400 microliters of MC4100 to each one. And then you will add 200 microliters of the respective phage to each one. Notice that's the same ratio of phage to bacteria as over here. We've just doubled the amount, right? OK. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do two different experiments with some of these tubes. We're going to use two sets of plates, LACMAC plates and Aramac plates. And that's because we're going to be looking for inserts that happen anywhere in the genome. Those are the LACMAC plates. That's one set of experiments. And then there's a different set of experiments where we're asking for inserts that happen specifically in the Arabinose operon. Don't confuse those two things. A lot of people think all we care about is the Arabinose operon in this experiment. It's not true. Okay? All right. So the first part, what we're going to do is we're going to take all of these tubes, and they're all going to incubate it uh, at the same time. Let's just look at these three first. They're going to incubate for 20 minutes at room temperature. And then we are going to take 100 microliters from each. So there's 600 in there, so there's plenty to use, right? And we're going to plate them on. LAC, MAC, plus AMP plates. These are McConkie plates, so they're going to be red. They will have a green and a black stripe. Okay. You're going to need four of these plates, 
one, two, three, and then you're going to need a fourth because you're also going to take some uninfected MC4100, the same stuff you put in these tubes. You're going to take some of your original MC4100 and you're going to plate that on some on a LACMAC plate, just straight onto an, a LACMAC amp plate. So that's another control, and you're going to say, what are you asking there, right? You're asking, can it grow on ampicillin? So that is a, how often does ampicillin resistance spontaneously occur? Or, how good is the ampicillin on our LACMAC plates? That's what we want to know, because if our ampicillin isn't working, or if these cells are resistant to ampicillin, this whole experiment has a problem. So that's what that, uh, that's what this control right here is telling us. So these uh, get spread, incubated overnight, and what you will see are red and white colonies. So this is a McConkie plate with uh, red and white colonies on them. Now these are older colonies, so they're pretty big, but uh, the red colonies are actually E. coli colonies that are bright red, and the white colonies are not. <laughs> but you can even see that uh, they have tiny little red dots in the middle of them. Those are not red colonies. Those are white. So white colonies do get a little pink center. That doesn't make them red. All right, so you can see the difference. That's what a red colony looks like and what a, a white colony looks like on a McConkie plate. All right, yours, if you look at them the next morning, are going to be much, much smaller than that. So you are better off coming by later the next day. Now, if you leave them there for several days, those white colonies slowly turn pink and eventually red because all cells do produce waste, and that waste is acidic, and everything slowly turns red. So you must check your data. This is why I tell you that your data will go away on these plates. The acid's produced, and everything turns red. So count the numbers of reds and whites. And that information is actually going to tell you about um, how much of the genome is being used by the cell. Okay. So, what are we going to do next? Well, we're going to use the 0, negative 1, and negative 2 after 20 minutes as well. So they're all incubating all at the same time, of course. So all four of these incubate 20 minutes. And we will take 100 microliters and plate them on Aramac AMP. So the Aramac AMP plates have a blue stripe and a green stripe. And so the LACMAC AMP and the Aramac AMP, the difference is the sugar, right? So LACMAC AMP, they turn, the colonies turn red because of the lactose, Aramac AMP the colonies turn red because of the lactose. You're going to do a control over here too, but it's going to be a little different. We're already, we've already tested for ampicillin. Here we need to test for the arabinose. So we have a special plate that has Aramac but no ampicillin. It has a single blue stripe. We keep it separate so that it doesn't get used by accident. So you're going to take some of your MC4100, dilute it 1 to 10, and plate 100 microliters of that on our special no ampicillin Aramac plate. And that's a control to see can our MC4100 grow on Arabinose. Since spontaneous mutations can rescue these cells from Arabinose sensitivity, some colonies will show up on this plate and we'll be able to determine the frequency of spontaneous ampicillin resistance. Let all of these grow overnight at 32 degrees. Again, better later than early. If you don't see anything the next day, you can let them grow a little bit longer, but uh, it's unlikely that anything will change. 
What you do see, you should count reds and whites. It's really the whites that we care about. Reds are spontaneous mutants to amp, uh, era plus, which have nothing to do with lysogeny. We'll explain that later, but it's the whites we care about. And you should patch the whites, up to 20 of them, using the patches, uh, patch grids, I should say, that are in your lab manual on era MAC plates, LAC MAC plates, and era plus LAC MAC plates. That's a new one that you haven't seen yet. and has a blue and black stripe. You won't need that until day two and incubate that overnight. So you patch the whites from the Aramac amp plates onto all three of these plates. So they should all be white on Aramac because you're patching white from Aramac. The question is, what color are they on these two plates? Are they white on both? Red on both? Red on one and not the other? That's the question. Now, if you have a whole bunch of them and you want to patch a couple reds, that's okay. If you only have a couple and you don't have 20, you don't have to patch those couple 20 times. Just patch what you got. If you don't have any, well, that's the way it goes. Don't worry. All right? Patch as many as you have. The whites are the ones we care about. Okay? But if you want to patch a red or two just to see what happens, that's fine. The next day, record what you see on those patches. The best way to do that is to create a grid. With the patches that you have, you'll have up to 20, and what they were on those plates. So you have an Aramac plate, a LACMAC plate, and an Aralacmac plate. What were they? White, 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 red, white, white, red, white, red, red. What, were the, what was the pattern for each patch that you did. And remember how to patch. It's exactly like in the strep lab. You take a toothpick, you touch the colony, and what you'll be doing on these is touch a colony, patch, 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 stripe, stripe, stripe. Right? So you'll be going back and looking at the stripes. Don't make little dots. Make a nice big fat stripe so you'll be able to look at these and tell. What are you looking at? Nice big fat stripes. You have a nice picture if you decide to use this one for your poster. Remember, photo document everything. So here is the entire experiment. So if you sat through this um, video, here's the payoff. One page, the entire experiment as a flowchart. So, good luck on the experiment, do well, get lots of data, and we will see you in lab.